Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for the Milwaukee Public Library's feature, local artist Meg Sasso with Sculpture Milwaukee. I'm just going to wait about one minute just to make sure that everybody who is logging on has a moment to get situated and make sure they can hear and see everybody tonight. Um, while we are waiting, make sure to check out um, our handout, which is attached to this webinar that you can download. It will have a lot of links and other information that you might want after we speak. All right. Very good. All right, so let's kick it off this evening. Um, hello, everyone, again. My name is Beth. I work for the Milwaukee Public Library, and I'm typically working at the East Branch, which is located on North and Kramer Street. I hope you can come visit us now that we are reopened, mostly for the public. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for our Sculpture Milwaukee Local Artist feature. Um, assisting me with tonight's program is my colleague Fawn. She is behind the scenes this evening. She is a librarian at the Tippy Canoe Branch. If you have any technical issues, you can enter them into the question box. And if you have questions or feedback for our panelists, we will have the program to follow up with those. In that handout that I mentioned before, um, there'll be helpful links to much of the content we cover tonight. Um, there is also a link to a downloadable document, um, which includes our statement on race and social equity. The statement includes a curated reading list for all ages. I hope you have the opportunity to share and reflect on this full statement and share your thoughts with the Milwaukee Public Library. Um, in a couple of days, if you are watching tonight, we will send you a follow-up email with a recording of this program and further information for you to look up. All right, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first esteemed guest, who is Mary Lou Node from Sculpture Milwaukee. She is the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Education, and she is here with us tonight to talk about the work Sculpture Milwaukee is doing and to introduce our feature artist. Welcome. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Thanks so much, Beth, for having us and, and for inviting us to be a partner with the library. I'm really proud for tonight's launch of our partnership um, that also introduces a book-loving audience to Sculpture Milwaukee's artist-driven reading list. Um, since we'll all be going back inside shortly, we hope tonight's group will um, enjoy books for adults and kids alike. Um, as you experience the works in our show. And I want to thank Maggie Sasso for her very inventive work, um, which she'll talk about very shortly. And thanks to my colleague, Brian Fister, for all his work in our educational programs. I want to share with you very briefly some background on how Sculpture Milwaukee is brought to life. Um, we were founded by Mr. Steve Marcus, Chairman Emeritus of the Marcus Corporation, who had the idea to bring a world-class art to downtown Milwaukee 15 years ago. Um, he wanted to create yet another legacy gift for the city, like Summerfest, and to add to our robust cultural community by making culture accessible to all. Uh, we're now in our fourth year, and what a year it has been. Uh, coronavirus upended a lot of our normal processes, but I'm happy to say that our board was really committed to bringing something that would be um, really great relief to the, the world we've been living in the last eight months or so. Um, and we've added a lot more educational materials to our website, so I urge everybody to go online. We know that a lot of people are doing homeschooling. We've got things for all ages. We've got hands-on activities. And since Sculpture Milwaukee is already physically distanced, you can enjoy a self-guided tour with friends and family while minding the safety mandates of the city of Milwaukee. Um, our last slide was um, just uh, a thanks to our donors who, who have, you know, brought the, really made a commitment to bring Sculpture Milwaukee to the streets. Um, public art is always free, leaving no barriers to participation but it also requires real resources, even in a volatile environment like 2020. So I just wanna thank all of these donors who have helped us bring great work to the streets um, for citizens and visitors alike. So we do have a team of over 100 who bring Sculpture Milwaukee to um, life, and this is an image from 2018. This group includes artists, gallerists, registrars, riggers, shippers, landscapers, security, maintenance teams, fabricators, marketers, web designers, educators, docents, storytellers, and tour guides. In other words, we're fortunate to have such a great team of experts, volunteers, um, who really bring the show to the street. And every year we bring an incredible range of artworks to the city, um, such as 
British African artist Thomas J. Price's Within the Folds, Dialogue One from 2020. The artist describes this piece as a sculpture about statues. And he supports the conversation around monumentation that's taking place in the United States and the United Kingdom. Traditional monuments are typically of white men, politicians, warriors, conquerors, who represent history from the side of the victors. By creating a work based on the Caribbean immigrant Windrush generation that settled in London, Price questions how and who deserves to be celebrated in our common spaces. We have works that light up the street at night, such as Julian Opie's work, Natalie Walking, Left, and Chicago-based artist Tony Tassett's Blob Monster. This comical figure is painted with Jackson Pollock drips, but also asks us to think about how realistic our fears are. Are they childish or are they rooted in the real world of today? Pollock Crown's giant crumpled solo cup, cup next image, um, uh, explores the scourge of single-use plastic and how our party culture thinks only of today, not of tomorrow's cleanup. And at the Wisconsin Center District, we placed uh, Neri Ward's Apollo Poll, a work that explores the history of voting rights in the United States, very, very timely, um, while honoring the Apollo Theater that brought to us generations of major black artists who have provided the soundtrack for Americans since the 1930s. So we hope you'll all enjoy these works. We have 13 others uh, in our downtown. Here's some maps. They're cited along Wisconsin Avenue and in the Third Ward. You can download this map on our website, www.sculpturemilwaukee.com. And we also hope you'll send us pictures, selfies of you doing fun things around the artworks um, and really just get some exercise, enjoy some fresh air um, as we go into lockdown. Uh, Beth and Maggie, back to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mary Lou. All right. And then I want to introduce our featured artist this evening. Mm -hmm. Maggie Sasso is a Milwaukee based textile artist producing conceptual bodies of work that express macrocosmic ideas through deta microcosmic detail and it examines the role of material culture in relationship to our collective past. Rendering moments of uncanny vastness, she presents the balance between difficult tragedy and humorous optimism and regards ordinary stories from Midwestern characters as sacred legend. Her installations are tactile and penetrable, presenting objects as the theatrical props and material relics and inviting us to simultaneously explore the past and consider our collective future. I am so happy to have you here this evening and welcome. Thank <laughs> Thanks you for joining so us. Much having me it's been just a delight to meet you and um, be part of this really amazing series that you are putting on and to be the inaugural for sculpture milwaukee what an honor mm -hmm. welcome so um here's your work tell us about it <laughs> yeah so um this this piece which we actually just brought down on wednesday we deinstalled it for the winter um because the the elements will just be a little bit too much for it um the snow would probably damage the fabric etc but it was um located in an absolutely beautiful spot outside of the northwestern mutual building on their pristine campus that is just so beautifully manicured and it's landscaping which was a delightful backdrop for this sculpture which is a one-fifth scale model of the Milwaukee Breakwater Lighthouse rendered in fabric. And I'm sure many of you listening recognize the lighthouse from your drive over the Hone Bridge or walking along the lake shore near the, the Milwaukee Art Museum. Um, I really fell in love with it um, on a, a little boat trip that we took. Uh, I wasn't living in Milwaukee at the time, so I came to the city for a birthday boat party and we were out on the lake and I was like, what is that thing over there? And we got closer to it. And uh, from a distance, it just was so cute. But then as we got closer, you know, the waves were really exaggerated, crashing up against the wall. And uh, it became an interesting thing from afar to a sort of ominous figure 
Um, and I just imagined trying to live there. There's no way to get onto the lighthouse except to leap off of a boat and grab onto a ladder, which I'm sure for some people is relatively easy to do, but I would have a very difficult time doing that. So I was just really um, overwhelmed by the structure and then ended up moving to Milwaukee and just kept looking at it as this fascinating object in our city's landscape. And um, what really captured my attention ultimately is this sense of isolation that we get when we think about living there. Um, to be so close to the city and yet so far away, I think really mimics the isolation that we feel in our own homes. And that was before the, the global pandemic hit. So I think that that feeling has really been elevated. Um, we've all experienced that more and more. So, you know, that phenomenon of living right next to people, but never really knowing who they are. Um, so that was kind of the catalyst for the, making the sculpture. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's home. Yes, yeah, and it was really, it was such a pleasure to have this piece in Sculpture Milwaukee. Um, when I first made it, I made it for the indoors. And um, in fact, we can maybe see it on the next slide, if we wanna go ahead and look there. Um, yeah, so it was originally made, I received the Knoll Fellowship in 2016, which is a really remarkable reward award for um, Milwaukee-based artists. It's a financial gift um, and there's notoriety and you get to work with curators and it's uh, it's a real luxury to receive this grant. Um, so I received it and was able to make really large work for the first time because I could afford to. I had a budget to work with. Um, so I, I had worked relatively large in textiles before, but not quite to this degree um, because, you know, fabric's expensive, the time it takes is expensive. At the time I had a nine month old daughter, so I had to, you know, be able to pay for babysitting to get time to work in the studio um, because the whole thing was handmade um, out of marine grade materials. So I had sort of intended to have the piece shown outdoors at some point in time. Um, and I, I was really interested in the, like this idea of it billowing in the breeze. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit, but I made it all in my studio basement, which is where I am right now, um, on my little, you know, tabletop sewing machine. I have an industrial sewing machine now um, that I actually borrowed from my studio mate, but I have access to one now. But at the time I was just like doing these, you know, these four foot by 12 foot long pieces of fabric, putting them through my little tiny sewing machine um, with a real attention to detail because um, my education was in formal craft. So those details are incredibly important to me. A well-made object, I think, has a certain reverence um, and gives people the experience of uh, like being in awe of the artist's hand and the, the links that they go through to create a really nice object from hand. So that was part of it. And then the image you're seeing on the right is um, my husband and I presenting to the architects and installation experts for Sculpture Milwaukee because we had made it for the indoors and it was made out of small uh, conduit on the inside, that's the interior structure and this fabric that was latched on using just Velcro. Um, and so all of a sudden with the prospect of having this sculpture out and about in potential very high winds, um, they were calculating for 100 mile per hour winds. So that was the goal. <laughs> and I, I lived um, right on the lakeshore for a short time, which was part of why I got so invested in maritime culture, just because I could see that lake every day and think about it a lot. Um, but I 
I'd gone through a 98 mile per hour wind burst uh, while at home one day and just saw trees falling over and our grill scooting across the, the patio. And I was like, well, wow, yeah. I mean, it really does have to withstand a lot. So we had to go through this enormous process to beef up the interior structure, make it out of much um, more heavy duty material and weld a column that could be bolted down to five foot deep rebar reinforced concrete. So it was uh, it was quite the process. And luckily my husband is an engineer, so he was able to really negotiate with the engineers um, for Sculpture Milwaukee so we could come to a, a balance of something that was doable and affordable but also really safe because they you know were assuming that we had an unlimited budget and a team of a thousand to work with when in fact it was just us at our house so that was quite the process and I think if you look on the next slide you'll see a little bit here's kind of a, a view of the structure on the left is um some of the interior structure being welded up and also a much heavier conduit pipe with really heavy reinforced um, corner braces. And then the video was it's kind of a funny so ad that we captured. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> it's just my husband. He climbed up there and was uh, mimicking wind by shaking it about. It was pretty funny. <laughs> given me the whole hey, that seems pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah and we made it all on the back our back patio luckily we have a kind of large pad in the back um and it became a play area for our daughter and her friends and you know it was kind of neat for them okay. and it's now the structure is back on our back patio right now <laughs> till we you, see, you, you get to store it over the winter huh i love that yeah, exactly exactly there's no better place to put it so and i mean it's we had those tough. really high winds last week so i can imagine it really got tested yes exactly well. i think we had, uh, like 45 mile per hour winds was kind of the max so half of what we'd planned for luckily i wouldn't have wanted to see 100 that's that's pretty intense mm -hmm. Very <laughs> um cool. yeah we move forward another yeah. look at the next slide Oops, there's that there's that video one more time. Um, so here it is again, just to just to show you, you know, the journey that it went through. Um, so well positioned behind that enormous um, Northwestern Mutual building. I really like how, you know, it's a very large object that I made. You know, it's 15 feet tall, but compared to that sk skyscraper, it's just so diminished in size so it was you know the the play with scale just continued to to work in really interesting ways for the, for the piece <clears throat> um and then if we look at the next slide the uh i just wanted to give everybody some context for where this work is coming from um like i said we we were living right on lake michigan and my husband who's obviously an important role, has an important role in my life and in my work. Um, he'd gotten a job working at Evan Rood, which makes outboard engines. And uh, he's, an, he's a mechanical engineer, but he's also kind of a hands-on person and weaseled his way into the position of driving boats into logs to test the engines, which was really fun. But also, I was horrified that it, at how dangerous it was. And um, not, not surprisingly, though I didn't even realize it at the time, I started sneaking in safety devices into my work. And this is one of them. So this is um, a rescue device from the 1920s and that really existed. It was kind of a prototype. It did not make it because it was a ridiculous object. It was a pair of pants sewn into a buoy on a rope. So if somebody went overboard, they would throw this thing out to them and the person was to, you know, throw all the waves and the crashing, climb into the pants and be hauled out of the water, which was hysterical. Um, 
And so I saw a prototype, you know, in a maritime museum and decided to remake it. And I remade it in my own aesthetic language. Um, I'd been in marching band. And so I sort of used that aesthetic to mimic the Navy aesthetic. And, you know, it's this kind of silly plaid. And the buoy was made out of an inflatable and it didn't hold air terribly well. So it would just sort of like do the thing that textiles can do and sort of like sag, but that made it a funnier version of itself. Um, and I'm, I started out in woodworking, so I handmade the pulley and uh, tied up the rope in a really interesting way. And then I took it out onto a friend's sailboat um, in the Puget Sound, and we did a photo shoot with it. So a lot of my work, th I'm thinking about the history of objects and, you know, in the last 10 years, it's been maritime objects, but it's been all sorts of objects other than that in late before in my career. And then um, I also like to contextualize the work outside of the, the place in which it's shown. So not just a gallery space, but imagining as if it has had a life beyond that gallery space. And the example I like to use is, um, as a 10 year old, I went to the Smithsonian American History Museum and saw the ruby slippers from the Wizard of Oz. And it blew my mind to like see the actual object from that movie. Just, it really broke down the fourth wall in a special way and a way that having to do with objects. So I love the, theatrics of objects and the potential they have for performance. And that's kind of what I was exploring in this work. Um, and then looking at the next slides, pause for water. Um, I had the great fortune of working with my dear friend, Laura Miney, who I'm guessing is maybe in the audience. And if that's true, hi, Laura, I love you. Um, but she and I did a lot of research. She went through and found hundreds of articles about the lighthouse and she would bring information to me and ask if it was something that I was kind of interested in. And then she would dig in even deeper when it was something that I did find really fascinating. So here are just a few clips of articles that she discovered for me um, that ended up informing the sculpture. So, the trio marooned in lighthouse. This was a story about, I think from 1948, of three Coast Guardsmen who were living out on the lighthouse and they got trapped out there and there was no electricity and no water. Um, so three days was a pretty long time when you were only supposed to be there for two days. Um, so it was starting to look kind of dire and they had to like crash through ice and rescue these, these workers. Um, but that the term marooned came up a lot in the articles we, we read. So, and also, so the name of the lighthouse sculpture that was in Sculpture Milwaukee was too much sea for amateurs marooned. And that was pretty much a direct quote from these articles that we found. Um, the Coast Guardsmen rescued a lot of boats that tipped over. So in the original showing of the piece, I had also paired it with um, another work that was all about one of those rescue missions. Um, so it was, you know, those articles informed the piece so much and lots of the little details that went into it. Um, there were, is, let's go to the next slide. The, uh, there was one great article about a Scarlet Tanager who landed on the lighthouse and it was injured. It wasn't supposed to be migrating in that area. So it was injured and the lighthouse keepers nursed it back to health and then sent it on its way. But it was just like how delightful that it, um, it made the newspaper. And Laura, my hobbyist historian collaborator, knew that I really liked the color red in my work. So that was the ultimate reason that she brought it up. But it's so metaphorical. And I have the flag with me right here since we took the lighthouse down. So and it fared quite well in the weather, I must say. Yeah, that looks very new. Wow. I know. Just like a little bit of dirt. But yeah. no, like, all the stitching is right in place. 
kind of and cool. how is the bird on the flag is it drawn on or did you patchwork it, it on that's a good question i it is painted on with um an acrylic paint that you mix with a golden acrylic fabric medium so that it becomes a really nice fabric paint um, and i knew that it just yeah, and I painted it on one side and then flipped it over and painted it on the other side. But it holds up really well. Um, but I mean, look at how much detail on the thing that you can't even see on the sculpture. And that's <laughs> just like, I can't. But we got to see it. <laughs> I know, we got to see it. So mm -hmm. yeah, there, there you go, there you go. Um, and I mean, I love, Do you, as a librarian, do you ever get people coming in asking, bizarre research questions for yeah. <laughs> also i mean i'm sure all sorts of things are there any artists that come in and ask for help yeah um i personally don't get at, at a brand at the branch i don't get too too many like super specific well, i have in any way like for constructing things i get i work oh. at a branch near the university so it seems i get you know students that are really digging down into like footnotes. And then one of my favorite patrons that I used to help a lot, I haven't seen her in a little bit, but she ran a music appreciation program at the um, assisted living facility she lives at near the lake. And she would come in with a list of classical music where she'd be like, I need this Chopin piece concerto with a timpani drum and a bugle. And you're like, wow. <laughs> I have to find like that track for her on a CD because she doesn't use a computer to do like Spotify or you know like how I would just look it up on my app and do it we, I would have to find like a CD that we could get for her because she would just play the CD and that like was always really interesting like dig down deep and then um, if the questions got really technical for a question about how to maybe construct a flag like that or what kind of material or I need to identify this antique, we will send people to Central Library to the Arts Department and they have specially trained librarians that will help them and they have archives of stuff, Christie's catalogs, all sorts of great things. So that's amazing. It's always fun. It's a cool resource. I've always mm -hmm. thought so we love questions like that. Bring them to us. Yeah. <laughs> bizarre things that you would probably not research on your own. That's mm -hmm. cool. absolutely. <laughs> so please, we'll talk a little bit more about ways you can look well, up some of stuff like this at the end. So I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um. Okay. So I I was gonna show you guys one more piece. Um, to tell you how kind of contextualize again and tell you how I was feeling about it being out in the elements. Um, this was a piece that um, I showed in Madison, Wisconsin at the James Watrous Gallery, um, which it was a great honor to have a show there. And if you've never been, you should check it out the next time you're in Madison. It's beautiful. Um, and I was still thinking about maritime culture very much and was learning how to weave and spent a lot of time weaving this sail because I was interested in um, the role that textiles plays in sailing. Like, you know, it's a boat and, you know, wood floats and, you know, there's like math that we do to figure out the physics of that. But when you really think about the the humble textile being the thing that propels this enormous object it's pretty fascinating so i wanted to make a very fragile version of that to push the narrative of you know a fragile textile being in a vulnerable situation in nature um and i spent so i you know spent a lot of time weaving hand weaving it and made the rope and then I took it to Lake Michigan and I tossed it in the lake, which is something that most weavers do not do with their handmade textiles. And it, we had this wonderful photo shoot with my um, friend and collaborator, Ben Dombrowski, uh, where we photographed the, the sail kind of coming back to land. And so we got great images of it kind of floating and sinking. And then the 
close up that you're seeing on the right is of it washed up on shore and just getting really sandy and kind of beat up. And um, it was for me at the time, a metaphor about motherhood and how, like how strong you have to be. I just, you know, I'd become a mom and my daughter had colic really badly. So the first year was a lot of me bouncing and listening to really loud screaming and just the amount like the vulnerability that I felt but also the strength that I had to maintain to get through that experience um felt very much like the sale kind of being vulnerable in Lake Michigan uh, but I, I fell in love with the idea of deterioration of objects because of nature. So that's why I was really excited when Marilou asked for me to remake this, the lighthouse and put it outside. I knew that it would get some damage, um, but I like, I like that in an object. I like the history of an object, the material culture of an object tells a story. So when you, you know, when you go into an antique store or look in a museum and there's a rip, there's a story behind that rip. And that's that's the stuff that I find so fascinating and so interesting and that sort of ignites my sense of wonder of like experiencing what the experiencing other people experiencing objects through the object. It's just really rich territory. Um, so I think we've got one more video of the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And this is I think this was. 40 mile per hour gusts. So this was a pretty good windy day. Um, and I'd had to, it, originally when I showed the piece, the windows were just solid, but to show it outside, I needed to vent it. So I cut vents around all of the windows and they just flapped so beautifully in the breeze. And the whole piece really breathed in the outdoors. Um, and it did experience some rips before the stanchions got put up, I think from maybe curious kiddos, which oh. I totally understand. <laughs> and I harbor no anger towards the mom that looked away for a minute when that happened. I completely get it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in, in fact, you made the chance to um, repair it and mend it a little bit, which is a you know an interesting aesthetic and dives into that concept. So. So there Do we have play it. it one more time for everybody? Yeah, Let's sure. Do it. Be mem mesmerized a little more. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and for me, this is where the well-made aspect of it comes into so much play. You know, it's functioning as it should because you've made it so well. Yeah. Yeah, and it really has held up. I mean, there was quite a bit of sun damage, like it's mm -hmm. it's faded a bit. But in some ways, I like that because it's sort of looking sepia toned now. Um, mm -hmm. a, another nod to the to the history of it. Um, I mean, it was it's kind of a sepia toned object at anyways, and then for it to fade and become a little more homogenous is pretty cool. So, yeah, let's see. Oop. We'll let it play one more time and then I'll go forward. <laughs> and I took a lot of great footage of it in the wind and I'll be editing together a video, a little bit longer video um, and putting that up on my website. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, that was so fascinating. I love, especially how you aren't afraid to like put your pieces through kind of their paces that that fascinates me too. I worked for the Harley Davidson Museum for a few yeah. years a while ago and yeah. um, our, the archivists there were very much, we had a lot of motorcycles that were very old and people were like, well, why, why are they, why do they have some like dings and scratches and you didn't like restore them? And they're like, you can restore a motorcycle once, but you lose all the story behind it. So they're whole yeah. purpose was just to clean it up and make sure it wasn't going to deteriorate and to preserve it, but not to like mend all the, the life behind what had happened to it. So I love yeah. that so I much. Do too. Yeah, it's really interesting. Archivists are fast, they have fascinating careers. Um, I got to work a little bit with the individual who's restoring Mary Knowles' house. 
Mm -hmm. um, have, have you been to her house before? Yeah, yes. I mean, of course, it's a classic. And I didn't grow up in Milwaukee, so I <laughs> learned about it later. But it's I definitely so went the first time as like, we have to go see the scary house, you know, like in high school and you have your driver's <laughs> license. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Such classic. And then when you learn more about her and how, you know, people probably thought she was a witch because she was a single woman who chose to live a very alternative life with her wealth and make these incredible sculptures and you know it's it is easy to come up with a narrative when you're sort mm -hmm. of uninformed but she was such a fascinating person so cool. and so she left her estate to um i guess the city of milwaukee but now the john michael kohler art center has it and they're trying to figure out how to archive and restore the house and they they ended up just picking it the year 1998 and you know, there's the, all sorts of questions of is like, okay, the house needs to be repainted. Originally, it was this red color, but it's faded to this rust color. Do we match paint to this rust or do we paint it the original red and let it rust again? So they, they decided to pick the, you know, rustier color, but I, I could have talked to those people all day. Just so okay. curious. I know it's amazing. Those stories need to be preserved. So they're, mm -hmm. That's what makes it interesting. You know, that's why somebody with a asymmetrical face is a little more interesting to look at than somebody who's perfectly symmetrical. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. wonderful. Well, um, part of the reason we kind of connected with Sculpture Milwaukee as the public library was this um, really, really awesome thing that they had you do, which was pick some books that kind of inspired your work in the piece that you put forward for them. So not yes. only you, but every artist that is featured in this year's exhibition has some books that they've selected and you can find um, all of the artists' choices on the Sculpture Milwaukee website. And we have the link to that in our handout, which you can download if you like. Um, and these are the ones that you chose, Maggie. Do you want to kind of tell us why? Of course, yeah. I mean, they're all about women and their roles in bodies of water, um, which is what my work is about. And they, these are just the three books that I um, that I've you know found really interesting and really fascinating. Um, so, the True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle, such a great book. It's actually children's. It's a children's book. Um, it's fiction. It's a very short, it's a quick read, um, and it's a real page turner. And it's um, written by Avi, who does a remarkable job of doing research. So the story is about Charlotte Doyle, who's only 13 years of age, and she stays behind in Europe to finish her studies, and her parents go to America, and then she's to make the trip to America on a boat by herself. Um, and she's supposed to be on sort of a luxury boat, you know, escorted by somebody nice. But she ends up not on a luxury boat, but rather like a, you know, a serious transportation vessel. And she's the only passenger. And turns out, you know, like, not everybody is as they seem. And it's a mystery. And there's a murder. Um, and I won't, I won't give away many of the details, but we'll just say that she ends up being the captain by the end of the trip. And it's just remarkable, you know, like what a great heroic story. Um, but what really makes it, what really drew me in were all the little details. So Avi, the author, did a lot of research reading sailors' journals from that era. So you get like this really amazing working understanding of a, of a ship. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. So I, recommend, I recommend this for adults and children. It's we, just a, yeah, we always read. say, don't let the, where they shelve it deter you. You know, if it sounds compelling, read the book. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Or even read it with a kid in your life together, you know? Yes, exactly. And I can't wait. I think Marg, my five-year-old's a little young, but we'll be reading it. Keep it on and the we'll shelf. Be future our trigger for her first card when she's in first grade. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and then the next book is Manhattan Beach. I got it. Yeah, which 
was it 2016? No, a little earlier than that when it came out. Um, but, and it was like on the New York Times bestseller list, but my friend recommended it because the main character and the story starts when she's 13 years old and she kind of um, like people, there, there's a, one main character that finds her extra memorable because she stands in cold water in bare feet, like in the, in this winter. Um, so that's kind of where the story begins. She gets older in the book um, and she becomes the first diver for the Navy during the World War II era. Um, and there are these, again, these really long informed scenes um, talking about her, like, you know, the politics of her being the first woman to have a role like this in the Navy but also of how those diving suits worked and what it was like, you know, these were the old metal ones that were incredibly heavy and difficult to wear and very, very dangerous. You know, you do one thing wrong and that could be not having enough strength and really horrible things could happen. So it's, um, I find the novel most compelling because of that aspect, but there's also, murder and lots of other, you know, New York uh, mob scene, interesting things that happen. Um, and she, the the main character has to contend with her own femininity and, and um, you know, she makes interesting choices that maybe we don't always agree with, but it's, you know, it, it's a great, it's a great book and one that's worth reading, especially because you learn about diving suits. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and you have it there. Have you have you read it yet? No, it's my next one to read. Oh, I've been okay. struggling. I've been struggling to focus this week. I don't know. Why, I, but yeah, I reading's yeah. not been like a thing that is happening, but that's my next one is as soon as the this week is like done and I can turn it in. So Yeah. Yeah. A little escapism. Mm -hmm, absolutely. <laughs> for you. And thank you for working those polls. It's really oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I worked election day. <laughs> we were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and then last is the Women Great Lakes Reader, which, you know, when I recommended this to Marilou, I couldn't find my copy. So I looked it up and recommended this one. And then I actually have a slightly different book, um, Women and the Lakes until Great Lakes Maritime Tales. And there it's, I looked into it and there are actually a lot of the stories are the same. It's just two different authors. Um, I got this at the Manitowoc Maritime Museum in their gift store a couple years ago. Um, and the person who wrote the author of this book, Frederick Stonehouse, um, is on the board there. So I'm not sure Victoria Brem wrote the the book that we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. um, it might be interesting to have her perspective instead of his, because then he he sort of talks about things like, can you believe women were doing these things? It's like, well, kind of the point, well, man. Yeah, we so maybe the story <laughs> does slightly better. That would be a I good mean, book report. <laughs> yeah, Compare exactly. contrast. But it does, you know, it has like lots of, so these are factual books, um, nonfiction, but it's got lots of great, you know, photographs and, and um, you know, just all sorts of fascinating imagery. And then the stories are great. And I think my favorite story is that of a 13 year old girl, actually 14 year old girl who is the lighthouse keeper's daughter. And um, her dad was out one day you know he was in taking care of important business elsewhere and a guy went overboard and started drowning and she like rode uh, a mile with a really heavy boat and really heavy oars and she rescued him and got a you know medal of an award a major award um that's awesome. and i mean that was great because it's it reminds me of charlotte doyle but she was a real life um girl so those are pretty fascinating, but they talk about women lighthouse keepers and how um, 
when the there were more women lighthouse keepers until the 1930s when the coast guard took over most lighthouses and then the women lighthouse keepers became very rare it was only in locations where there was one person who worked a lighthouse and then it could be a woman um oh. but and then like captains of ships who were women and um women who rescued rescued people and you know just like all facets of the great lakes and how women had a role an important role all along so yeah those are my three picks those are great picks and i like how they all have a unifying theme to go with them but they're all a little bit different in their own yeah. way so a kids book and a adult fiction bestseller and then you have a nonfiction like primary source document almost or a collection of primary source you know stories which I always yeah. like reading to kind of see yeah. where it's like the sea this isn't a historical this is where they could get the inspiration for these books and these stories that we read yeah. so absolutely yeah and yeah. all three of them and we'll we'll get the title and author of the one that you had and we'll include that book one too because i'm sure we have that at the library so you can definitely check those out and see if we have them in the catalog or on our ebook lending library to see if you want to maybe read them yourself yeah Very good and i oh, hear there's right. more resources for maritime culture at the library which i there know you're gonna is, there is so um, thank you so much, Maggie, for sharing, you know, about your piece and everything. Um, if anybody has questions for Maggie, now is the time if you want to drop them into that question box. Um, I'm going to talk for just a quick few minutes about things that you can find at the library and online through our website um, that might be of interest to you. So feel free to drop those in and we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, I know Maggie's friend did a lot of the research for um, the piece and I was kind of wondering did you have a schematic that you used to, you know, make the pattern and the, get the scale correct? Oh, yes. Yes, they were the original blueprints of the Breakwater Lighthouse. And the, it changed some, so I kind of looked at those original schematic blueprints um, and then compared it with photographs and one trip on the boat to like figure out what the windows looked like because it was a pretty mm -hmm. faithful replica though a distilled aesthetic obviously but yes absolutely because okay. yeah definitely looks just like it i love it <laughs> um, so if doing research like that is of interest to you just as a person who likes maritime culture or you're inspired by our artist talk this evening um the milwaukee public library actually houses the Great Lakes Marine Collection and the um, Maritime, oops, the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society. So um, they live in Central Library downtown. Unfortunately, due to COVID at the moment, you cannot visit in person, which is a bummer, but definitely hopefully in the future. Um, at Central Library, they have really awesome physical objects like this model of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which was a boat that actually sunk in the Great Lakes and is a famous shipwreck. Um, and they've got the Fitzgerald life ring as well that you can take a peek at, including some informational panels. Um, so in affiliation with the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society, the Milwaukee Public Library's Great Lakes Marine Collection includes books, photographs, ship files, log books, vessel plans, rec reports, and articles that document vessels that sailed the Great Lakes. So if you need to do any sort of research, they are kind of a really amazing and great source for you to do that. And then something that you can access at the moment, because it's digital, is this Milwaukee Waterways, the Milwaukee Public Library Digital Collection, which is part of the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society. Um, so if you go through our website or the link on the document that is attached to this webinar, um, you can find all sorts of digital images that you can browse and peruse. So I just looked up Lighthouse in the database and I found our lighthouse. So here is a picture of it. So you can kind of see what a great um, replica Maggie created. And um, there's all sorts of amazing things that you can see on there. Um, there. The photographs are from the Port of Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Public Library Historic Photo Collection, and the Great Lakes Marine Collection. 
a matching grant from the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program to help preserve these photographs and make them available online. Um, if you want to learn more about any of these amazing collections and discover more, please visit our website at npl.org. And again, due to our limited service model at the moment, the physical collection access isn't currently available. But you can always send questions to our librarians on our homepage in the Ask a Question feature. So it will send an email to an expert and they will get back to you as soon as they possibly can via email. Again, all these links for this information is included in the document that you can download or that we will email you in a few days. Um, I just wanted to show a couple more photos that you can see. So this is some more of the Edmund Fitzgerald, both it being constructed and it on the water. And there's all these little great details. And then when you're looking at the photo on the website, there is um, a lot of great text information and tags and subjects that the librarians have added to this collection. Um, another one that might be of interest as we come up on the holiday season, um, I recommend everybody go and look up the Christmas tree ship and learn a little bit more about that historical wreck, the Rouse Simmons. Um, this is actually a surviving branch with a Christmas ornament on it from that wreck. I don't want to oh. give too much information away because I'll be a little research project if you're interested. <laughs> All right, and then that is going to conclude our program besides questions. Before we get to the questions, I just want to let everybody know that we have a really special guest joining us next Tuesday. Um, Nancy Pearl, who you might know as a best-selling author and former librarian. She often is on NPR talking about books and being a writer. She's going to talk with us about books and her new book, The Writer's Library, The Authors You Love on the Books That Changed Their Lives. And that is going to be Tuesday. Sorry, the date's covered up on my screen. November 10th at 6 p.m. So I hope that you can all make it. We're also going to be talking about travel logs and far-flung reads that you might want to Check out yourself while we are all stuck here at home. <laughs> all right, and then I just want to show one more quick time the Sculpture Milwaukee 2020 sponsors. All these um, generous institutions have made it possible. And then I'm going to end the slideshow here so we can all just see each other. Boom. <laughs> All right, and then I do see we have some questions. And then feel free if anybody else has questions to just add them along or if you have any comments. Um, the first question is for Maggie. Maggie, what are you working on now? And is there still a nautical theme running through your current work? And this is from Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Um, I, you know, the pandemic, it's made it hard to do to do things um i especially with a, a small child at home so i haven't been quite as productive as i as i normally would have been more experiencing the trauma that we're all going through and then i know i'll be processing that trauma pretty soon i usually work when i have an exhibition coming up and it, so i like to make work for a new show um that's when i get most inspired and then when i'm not when I don't have a big show coming up, um, I'm usually diddling around. So I just did some natural dyeing work. This was from Cosmos from my backyard and then avocado pits. So that was kind of fun. I just happened to have all this stuff sitting right here. I also got into um, macrame hanging plants. And then this is so cute. I have to show you. My daughter wanted me to make one for her Barbie dream house. So I'm making the teeniest, oh. tiniest macrame you ever did see. <laughs> um, and then I made some masks for the um, Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco. So that, that was interesting. That was an interesting design problem. Um, so that's the, the basically what I've been working on. And then the, the lighthouse, getting it up and all that. Um, the, the last body of work that I made did not have the maritime theme as much. Um, it's I may be starting to move away from that um, 
the the metaphors aren't quite as strong as they were to begin with but you know i have so many bodies of work that involve the maritime theme so i'm sure i'll be showing those again and i certainly won't forget um, i've been looking a lot at surveyors rods i find those objects really fascinating and i've been kind of exploring that aesthetic and researching that a little bit and trying to figure out what the what the metaphors are in surveying and land and property and i like how surveying takes two people communicating across distances. Um, so I think that's kind of rich territory that I'll explore. Um, what else? I, I write songs, so I've been sort of writing some songs lately as well. They, they often accompany um, the work, so that that as well. So that's, there you go. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Um, I can agree with the pandemic not being conducive to doing too big of projects, even though yeah. we have best intentions, right? Uh, <laughs> I love that little macro made. Yeah, I know. It's hard to get that focused time to, you know, sit with an idea and really let it bloom. And But I know that it will surface. It will come back up. I hope so. We had a pumpkin vine just grow out of our compost heap this year i had no idea and i didn't know what it was going to be and it turned into this little cute white pumpkin actually i have it sitting in here um but i kind of am trying to envision that for my pandemic self like we had yes. to throw all the stuff our plans on the compost pile this year and hopefully it'll lead to something cool that we aren't expecting in the future so yeah i i feel that strongly um <laughs> It doesn't look like there's any other questions, but we did have a nice thank you and shout out from our new director, Joan Johnson. Thanks for being here, Joan. Um, yes. Excellent presentation. Kudos to you all from Joan, our new city librarian, um, who was featured recently in the Journal Sentinel. Please check that article out if you can. That's great. Some other good news is if you were interested, my light's kind of making it blurry here, but um, November 24th, we're going to do a special book to our club book chat about this book, Manhattan Beach, Jennifer Egan. Maggie will try to make it. We'll see. Yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> um, work. A book club that I've been running for a few years where we, while we chat about the book, we just make something creative with our hands while we'll talk. I am not an artist. I just like to try to do something to make my mind creative and make a mess for a little bit of time while we talk about some literature. So there's some more information about that in the handout again that I keep mentioning. <laughs> and then otherwise I'll the mini macrame while we're talking. I love it. Maybe I can find some like string at home and learn how to braid something and we can do totally. all do that together. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um Mary Lou, if you're still here, I don't know if you want to send us off, but it doesn't look like we have any further questions. Otherwise, we will end our webinar tonight and say thank you so much to everyone. Yeah, thanks again. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you, Mary Lou. Can oh. you unmute? <laughs> Hate that. I do that all the time. <laughs> no. Virtual life. I'm muted. There we go. Um, thank you so much. Really fun conversation. I love hearing about all the resources of the library. Thrilled again to be partnering uh, with you, Beth, and your team. And I'm excited about um, the craft project you're going to do with uh, Manhattan Beach. Yeah, we'll send pictures. I can't promise they'll be masterpieces. <laughs> <laughs> But very good. Um, we look to uh, the future and hopefully we'll be doing more stuff too, even into 2021. So um, I just want to tell everyone good night and good luck for the rest of this week. Thank you so much, Maggie and Mary Lou and Brian, who is watching this evening. And thank you again to all the attendees. We will email you that recording in a couple of days. Thank right. you so much. so much. Guys. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful night. <laughs> I'm going to end the thank webinar. You.